All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ben Pick, and this is Jack Manio. We are going through to discuss the cloud native infrastructure and how things have changed and some of the security pitfalls that you can go through uh, that you need to address that weren't in traditional pipelines. So if you want to move us along. Um, so I'm Jack Menino. Uh, I've been working at Invisium since 2009. Uh, sometime in between the rest of my work, I get to write a little bit of code. Uh, do most things in Scala and Go these days. Uh, any Scala programmers in here? Okay, good stuff. Um, uh, I do think a lot of things uh, about scale these days. Um, I worked for years doing penetration testing. Um, it's not particularly fun to find bugs anymore. I'm definitely more interested as part of my career in uh, solving things and making it damn near impossible for attackers to get in. And all right. And I am Ben Pick. I'm an application security consultant with Invisium. And my former life, I was also a agile and DevOps consultant. So I would go in, assess various teams, and give them recommendations for how they can improve. So some of the lessons learned from that are that we're applying in this presentation is you need to really just take full advantage of the systems that you're using and make sure that they integrate properly within your pipeline and more recently within the cloud. So this right here is your traditional pipeline. Uh, you can see in the lower left your developer. They are committing their code into Git. It moves in in a very linear fashion uh, through each of the various phases of your environment. So from dev to integration to staging to production. And you can see this very, very linear fashion of your developer committing the code and it going directly into production. Now at each stage, there are more and more tests. So say within dev, you'll look at the source code and you will just really, really try and get fast feedback. Uh, the typical rule is, you know, five minutes for the developer to go get a cup of coffee before they can know whether or not their code changes broke the build. And then as you get further and further towards production, there are much more in-depth tests that get run. So your performance tests, your dynamic tests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now this is your cloud native pipeline. Again, it is a flow from left to right in production. You can see a lot of the same tools sort of carry over. So you have Jenkins, you are working within Git, and this is a much more infrastructure aware environment. So when you are deploying into dev, the, uh, the, the pipeline itself is aware of your container registry and it's um, updating as needed or as you are designing within your pipeline. And this is using GitOps, which I'll go through in a couple of slides, but just wanted to address that term here. So it's using GitOps to manage your infrastructure and your code. Uh, and it's using declarative statements throughout the process to define exactly what is going on. Cool. Just a really quick slide to highlight some of our key summaries. Uh, you have old school on the left with your traditional pipelines and then new school, which is your uh, cloud native environments. So some of my experience with inconsistent environments. <coughs> Excuse me. You will have your gold image that gets produced by your systems admin or your operations teams. And over time, that developers tend to make changes too. Uh, so you'll have um, new, new uh, dependencies, new configuration settings within each of the various development teams. And what ultimately happens is those sort of cascade out until the gold dev image no longer looks like the gold prod image. And that causes a lot of issues where you are not necessarily finding bugs until they are in production. And looking at some of the rollback process for those bugs, well, when you are in production, a lot of times you won't find out about issues until your help desk comes in with massive amounts of calls. And then in traditional pipelines, there is a large process that's needed, which costs a lot of money to then uh, roll back all those changes. Whereas in cloud, uh, cloud native environments, you have what's called canary builds, where you are able to 
set up um, with your load balancer and say, I want 10% of the people to our site to be redirected to the updated version, whereas the 90% will be going to the known stable version. And then of those people that get redirected through your load balancer, they can say, well, you know, of those requests that come through, 5% of them are getting 500 errors. So based on the declarative rules that we have, we set that to know that the updated version is no longer stable. So then it redirects everyone back to the original updated version, er, the, sorry, the original known good state, and it kills the containers for the updated versions. So CloudNative can automatically handle that based on the rules that you have declared through uh, Canary builds. All right. And then I sort of mentioned this before, but everything is defined within your infrastructure, within your source code in Git. And so you need to manage your environments and make sure that that is well tracked, well documented. And you want to ensure that you are, um, that you are properly managing your branches. So where does security fall in? Well, you want to make sure that you're using multi-factor authentication so you can specifically tie an individual user to, um, sorry, you want to specifically tie an individual user to their identity. Then you want to make sure that they aren't committing anything without signing it. So you want to ensure that all the attestations get signed uh, for, the, for their commits. And you want to enable branch restrictions within the um, production so that one single developer is not a late, uh, one single developer or a single team is not able to commit or push changes into the master branch, which becomes your production. And that's, oh, cool. So one of the tools that you are using within Cloud Native is Spinnaker, which handles all of your communications. Now this tool, um, this tool is used for your uh, for, for your communication, so it's very, very important that it is properly configured and set up. And much like your applications using microservices, this follows the same process. So you have Gate, you have CloudDriver, Igor, Fiat, and Halyard. Now, Halyard is the configuration management service, which configures all the other services. Um, Fiat is the authorization service, which checks to make sure whether or not something has, say, service level uh, access and uh, queries it before um, running anything important. Then you have uh, Gate, which is the API manager. It's, sorry, the API gateway itself. And I believe that's everything. Passing off to Jack. Cool. Um, so one of the things we have to think about uh, in our kind of updated uh, workflows is where do we actually derive any value from the tests we run? Uh, so before we push and deploy things, uh, there's different things we're going to see. Uh, after we push things to an environment, uh, there's different integration tests we're going to see. Um, different things that, you know, we can't necessarily blame the developers um, when somebody that runs cloud infrastructure makes like an S3 bucket public, right? So there's things we can verify before we deploy, but then there's, you know, certain things that can happen after deployment that we want to know about, right? And those are unfortunately things that we're not going to get out of the way before we um, push. So it is important to get um, as much telemetry as we possibly can uh, out of all the tools we use and all the different events we um uh, generate. So uh, if we look at, for example, Spinnaker, right, um, handles um, deployment, uh, not necessarily the integration and build side. So you'll generally hook something like Spinnaker up to Jenkins um, using webhooks and stuff like that. Uh, so all of your systems are definitely very active in, in talking to each other. And the feedback loop is really important, right, because we can use that feedback um, to help our systems either recover in intelligent ways or um, let us know what's going on. Uh, so there's the whole world of um, chaos testing, right, which is um, what, can we, what can go wrong and um, ultimately, you know, how do we break our applications in the worst way possible? Uh, the stuff I'm talking about more today is verification, right? So verifying um, that certain preconditions are in place um, before you go live with code. So more on the verification side um, than experimentation side. 
so Jenkins X is another um, pretty popular um, cloud native CI CD tool. Uh, so it builds on Jenkins um, pretty significantly. It's uh, pretty much Jenkins um, reimagined um, with an opinionated kind of workflow on top of Kubernetes. So um, who's worked with Kubernetes in here? So the curiosity. Who knows what a namespace is? Great. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know what a Kubernetes namespace is, um, it's essentially a logical isolation boundary uh, where we can divide up things like role-based access control, um, networking, access to secrets. Uh, so the better segmented your architecture is via namespaces um, and doing that intelligently, the better off you're going to be. So once upon a time, uh, we kind of ran Jenkins and we had these big clusters. Um, and we had a few centralized systems, right? And those were the kind of keys to get into production for some people. Uh, we run these a lot more decentralized now, right? So more teams are going to have their own instances. Um, so I've seen environments where, you know, CI, CD is uh, kind of the security layer for, you know, getting anything into production and nobody um, touches, uh, you know, VMs and things like that. And now uh, we're giving people access to the clusters. So we have to consider um, what can they do? So if we make the namespaces too muddy, um, too many teams, you know, different applications kind of smashed into one place. Then everybody has access to pull secrets, um, deploy applications, read that data. So uh, we find that our development workflows kind of follow us right into production now um, because they're baked right into the cluster itself. Um, Kubernetes, uh, Jenkins X uses um, Tekton pipelines. Uh, so it's another way of essentially everything is, is going to be declarative, right? So it's YAML based representation for your uh, pipelines. Uh, the biggest distinction between Spinnaker and Jenkins X is that Jenkins X is it's, it's deeper integrated into Kubernetes um, via CRDs. So um, whereas Spinnaker introduces its own APIs, uh, Jenkins X actually uses um, Kubernetes to do a lot of its API back stuff. So building pipelines, running tasks and stuff like that. Uh, there's all Kubernetes um, CRDs to represent those things. Um, and you can also do things with Jenkins files as well. Um, so there's essentially like the serverless mode, and then there's static uh, mode as well where you can use Jenkins files. So, um, But the big difference here is that everything's being driven um, in a GitOps fashion, right? Um, ideally, we're not giving people direct access to clusters, but that happens all the time. So... We have security uh, opportunities and challenges. So uh, we have a lot more telemetry that we generate. We have a lot more events. Um, so we can use those things for good, right? Uh, the downside is that once we start missing things like webhooks, that means we're missing builds, um, we're missing events. So we can also have you know points of blindness um, if we just start missing events. Uh, with regards to observability, so um, we have the development systems we use. Uh, then we have all the other tooling as well, right, from our cloud um, to our containerized um, orchestration systems uh, to the things we can get from the containers themselves, right? Um, so there's certain things, you know, we'll get at runtime, right? Looking at a container and figuring out, you know, which syscalls it's actually using. Um, you know, granted, you can get some of that stuff through static analysis, but you can also run these things as well. Um, so there's certain things that you certainly want to see from different stages. Uh, and you really want to be careful of um, the security opinionations that are uh, in place for you. So one of the really nice things about both uh, Jenkins X and Spinnaker is that they abstract developers away from a lot of details. So you don't need to know as much about the cloud. You don't need to know as much about Kubernetes. The downside is that some of those opinionations might not necessarily match your tolerance for security and risk, right? So the way you kind of configure your cloud and do hardening and governance, it may be very different than the opinionations um, or, you know, minimal security built into these tools, right? So the goal is to get people up and running as fast as possible, um, not to make it as secure as possible and impossible to use, right? So one makes the developer happy, one makes everybody in this room happy. Um, this is a developer tool. And um, failure is everywhere, right? So this is an example of um, a Kubernetes cluster. And there's a lot that can go wrong there in terms of failure. So first off, we have a control plane. Um, I wish I had my little pointer thing, but you can see right here. Uh, this is pretty much the most important part of the cluster. So this is where the API server is. This is where um, you know data representing the state of the cluster is stored. Uh, and all the deployment, uh, resource management, uh, that all happens from the control plane. So uh, if you're using a managed service, um, something like EKS or AKS, um, they'll handle the control plane. But then, for example, on EC, uh, EC EKS on AWS, 
Um, you'll actually spin up, um, you know, essentially virtual machines for each of the Kubernetes nodes, right? So there's a little bit that the cloud handles, and then there's a little bit that you're still running instances at the end of the day. Um, so depending on how abstracted that is away from, you know, if you have to manage it yourself, um, you have to harden the control plane. If um, AWS is managing it, you have maybe a little bit less of that to do, but some considerations. Um, but things that can go wrong there, um, you can uh, not do proper um, isolation of containers. Uh, so if you're running containers super privileged um, or um, you're not, you know, using all the rule-based kind of security execution around them, uh, containers aren't really limited. They're limited by namespaces and uh, control groups. Um, things like Docker, for example, they're not hypervisors. There's not really a security boundary, right? So there's a lot that can go wrong there. Um, and, you know, with addition to, uh, you know, using uh, unmanaged services, right, uh, how many people think that uh, Kubernetes APIs are all over the Internet um, if you look for them, right? Um, like, they're everywhere. People make these public, and as we'll see, like, AWS and others don't necessarily make it hard for you to not do that. So um, then we also have code, right, because everything runs inside of containers um, as code. So, you know, the thing we kind of get lost in, we think about all the new pretty stuff, is that at the end of the day, we're still running code, right? But the difference is um, our code is maybe a lot more abstracted from the things around it than it was at one point. So um, things to consider, right, is that your application um, just might not understand what's happening outside of the application itself. So container orchestration and runtime systems, um, the container is important to get right. Um, so when we're testing, there's, you know, things we can do locally, right? Um, run things like Docker Bench. Um, you know, there's a million tools. I hate to kind of get up here and be a tool evangelist. Um, go on Google and search for them. I guarantee you there's some good tools out there. Um, but there's things you can kind of find those things locally, right? Uh, but there's also things you're not going to see um, with regards to container con configuration um, until deploy time, right? Because uh, there's certain things that, for example, Kubernetes, um, you know, there's other container orchestration technologies out there. Um, they can also mutate that state as well um, at emission. So you have emission controllers that can do things. Um, and you can also have different wrappers, um, things like security contexts, um, and other things that can potentially change what you see inside of like a Docker file or locally. So um, if you want to have visibility of all the different kind of states, um, then you need to, you know, test as you move through different environments, right? Um, from local to actually running it in a cluster. Um, uh, everything is declarative, so that's the good thing, right? So um, there's really not a lot of kind of guesswork. Um, the good thing is that everything um, happens right away. The bad thing is um, everything happens right away. Um, so the reconciler pattern is essentially uh, always trying to reconcile towards the correct state, right? So it's always um, trying to move ahead, and as soon as it has updates for different things, um, it goes to all, immediately apply those to your resources. Uh, with regards to IaaS and PaaS integration, so if you are running your own kind of bare metal cluster, uh, then there's a lot more uh, that you'd have to do to, to get it to work with, say, like, you know, EKS, right? So um, EKS, AKS, um, GKE, they're, they're integrated with things like IAM, um, different... Uh, you know, platform services and everything like that. So uh, if you're going to do things yourself like that, then you have to, you know, consider um, key management, right, credential management um, across your system. So I, I like to advocate for if you can use the platform managed way of doing things in some cases, do that. Um, it saves a lot of problems and things you have to think about later. Uh, the cloud is, uh, is an interesting one, right, because uh, your applications now are running um, inside of containers, uh, that are running on orchestration systems, and then the orchestration systems are glued to your cloud infrastructure, right? So um, essentially your applications um, don't really have any idea what happens there. So um, as you're building, testing your applications, um, these are the kind of tests you start to have to consider running, right? Um, when I go to deploy something, um, is the S3 bucket um, public? Can it be made public? Um, is the EBS volume encrypted that's going to be attached to this? Um, is the IAM role that's going to be basically injected has like allow all across AWS? Like, like there's certain things um, from a security perspective that you'd almost never want to happen, right? So these um, end up becoming things that, you know, happen inside of your integration tests and other parts of your test suite. Um, IAM is where it really gets interesting, though, because um, if you have, for example, um, an IAM role or a user you create for a platform, right, uh, and then you give that to a service account that then runs in a container, um, depending on what you've privileged that at the cloud level is going to dictate what happens 
Um, when that container gets compromised, an attacker starts to try to move laterally um, and pivot into other systems. So um, this is a newer thing, especially for AWS, just um, released recently the um, IAM to EKS. I know like Azure's done that for a while, GKE. Um, but these are things to consider, right? Because um, once you create these accounts, you create subjects, you tie them to IAM, uh, sometimes your developers start reusing them across applications. Uh, and then we have code that actually runs inside of these things, right? So, um, you know, I've heard this, right? It runs in the cloud, so like, you don't have to think about security, and like, it runs in containers, so like, they're isolated at this point. Um, no, right? Like, you're still writing code, uh, and, and in fact, like, the code you write is, is, is more complex. Um, we have more distributed systems, right? We have a lot more that can kind of go wrong. Um, we have, you know, a lot of interesting things, like I've seen people that have uh, migrated existing systems to, you know, cloud-native architectures, and, um, you know, from fairly monolithic systems, and they start to run into things like race conditions, kind of um, concurrency-related issues, um, where they move from, like, a monolithic workflow to using, like, something like Kafka um, and passing messages around, right, where there's just differences in terms of, like, how that flows. Um, so that is really important. Important, right? As you migrate existing systems to cloud native and then start to use cloud native tooling, um, you really have to make sure your security controls kind of follow with you. Um, the way you test um, applications, right? So things like, you know, I'm not going to get into today, like running your static analysis, like dynamic tools, like IS, like dependency stuff, right? Those, those things don't change. Like you still have places in the pipeline to run all that stuff, right? So the way you test your code arguably doesn't change there. Um, it's a lot of the other stuff that happens around it and integration, right? Um, things you won't actually know in the code until it's actually running um, in that environment, right? So just certain things that, that, that get harder, harder to mock out. So on the IAM side of things, um, depending on what you've allowed people to do inside of your cluster could potentially um, impact what they can do inside of your cloud. Um, so from, you know, uh, things like permissioning access to our container registries. So I see people do it a couple different ways, right? One is they put everything on the same cloud provider, right? So their source code management, their container registries, um, cloud stuff, like everything is under one hood, right? And um, they can use IAM, you know, minimize the credentials they pass around, access keys and stuff like that. So if you can do it all under one platform and that works for you, great. Um, in reality, most people don't build like that. Um, so it gets really important to figure out, um, you know, what can that uh, service account actually do in the cluster and in the cloud. Um, by default in Kubernetes, when you create um, a new pod, it'll use like a default service account. So I'll show an example of that like in um, Tekton here, right? So um, you can use, um, so this is if you want to create a pipeline using Tekton. Um, it follows the same pretty much like, you know, it's essentially running on Kubernetes, right? Um, so the way you'd run, you know, other resources, uh, very similar. Uh, but as you run with service accounts, um, so if you're using like default accounts, um, which is a common pattern, right? So, so people will create uh, a new pod, um, create a pod spec, they won't assign an account, and by default it'll drop you into like a namespace default account, which is an issue because um, when each of those accounts runs with those same privileges, they have access to pull secrets, uh, modify the containers kind of life cycle and everything like that. So um, it's really important to um, use uh, separate accounts for each of those things. Um, essentially here, this is like that same thing kind of um, in a different place. Uh, with regards to namespace versus cluster level, so generally you don't need to give um, your teams that are operating in different namespaces cluster level privileges. Uh, so the whole goal nowadays is that um, if you're doing it in GitOps properly, then you're not giving your developers access to the cluster to do anything. So they're updating their applications, they're doing all the deployments, all their modifications through Git, right? So if you're doing the GitOps kind of thing correctly, then your, your, your developers shouldn't be able to um, use kube control and uh, start doing stuff inside of um, Kubernetes API. All right. All right, so now we are going to focus back on the network and how to make sure that that is communicating properly without spilling too much, uh, especially in the way of secrets. Cool. So everything can go wrong. Um, a lot of these developers or whomever have a lot of faith in the tools that they're using. Um, there are still very, very, very insecure defaults. So it's important and imperative that you set up network isolation so that uh, you are controlling your blast radius. Essentially, you want to 
fail closed. So in the event that you are compromised or you want to um, prepare yourself to become compromised, uh, you are limiting what might be exposed or what a compromised account will have access to. And you can see uh, there was a talk a month ago now in Black Hat where they revealed that the EKS uh, was publicly accessible by default. So that was a very, very, very big concern. Um, you need to ensure that you are changing that and aware of it. Uh, likewise, logging is disabled by default, which uh, will help you clean up or identify where an issue occurs um, or clean up after an incident. So you need to ensure that you have that on um, and you're, uh, you're able to connect to it without authentication. So again, a lot of very, very surprising insecure defaults that you need to be aware of, change, and uh, plug those holes. So in terms of Jenkins and S3, uh, the S3 buckets that get automatically created are unencrypted. So that's, again, something you want to change the, the, the default settings. Um, it's also uh, Kubernetes, your, your Kubernetes is set up to be publicly accessible and publicly accessed. So those are some little tweaks here and there that you need to ensure that you are changing. Lastly, uh, you have Helm and Tiller particularly, which, um, again, you have your, you're able to access it without, uh, without authentication. And it's a lot of the same problems over and over and over again. So, you are storing your secrets in config maps, which are, again, potentially exposed. And you want to encrypt them. There's a lot of different methods you can use. Uh, one of them is uh, HashiCorp's vault. So if you keep your secrets in there, then you can have your various teams pass. Uh, if they need to use those secrets, they can pass them by reference. And your various teams can work together within the same environment without sharing secrets. And uh, don't do dumb stuff. So even without all the default settings, which you will need to go through and change, there are things that can sort of override the security settings, and they are named accordingly. Um, there's the insecure flag that if you use, it turns off verification of your YAML files, which is a good way to get uh, malicious code introduced into those configurations. So don't do things like use insecure flags, skip TLS checks, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe, okay. There you go. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, secrets management um, inside of a pipeline. So uh, secrets are um, one of those things that either people uh, handle those out of the gate when they build a system and uh, they have a secrets management solution in place or they get to production, everything works, and then they kind of get to clean up sprints and cycles and they say, like, let's fix secrets management at this point, right? And then by that point, you know, secrets credentials have kind of sprawled out um, between their different environments. So um, as you use different tools, right, um, your CI, CD tools, um, Helm. So uh, who's worked with Helm in here? We talked about Helm a bit today. Um, Helm is, uh, you know, first class implementation inside of Jenkins X. Um, you know, most cloud native tooling is using, like, Helm and charts and for stuff for deployments. But um, you have to think about, right, um, secrets propagate to some of those layers. Um, you have um, different tools with regards to um, uh, different uh, management tools, uh, different um, integrations. So there's a lot of different places where um, you can uh, inadvertently expose credentials. So it's one of those things, like, if you don't get it right kind of out of the gate, then it gets harder. Um, ideally, your developers, um, especially even at the Git layer, they're not handling secrets. Um, if you're doing this stuff correctly, then um, the secrets are getting injected somewhere um, beyond what um, is going to happen at the Docker file, right? So um, this is, you know, at your um, Helm chart is, is a place where you can kind of wire up secrets and stuff like that. Um, but ideally, uh, inside of Kubernetes, the challenge is that um, you can use Kubernetes as secrets management API, um, but then secrets are still stored in plain text um, inside of etcd. So you can encrypt those, 
Um, but it's, it's kind of, eh, it's a so-so implementation, right? Um, a lot of people use Vault, right, to kind of move it out of there. And um, Jenkins X, like, has integration with Vault. Um, Spinnaker, I believe, has some integrations with Vault and everything like that. And um, the Vault integrations for Kubernetes are getting better and better, right? So if that's one of the things I can recommend kind of getting right out of the gate, it's managing secrets. And um, if you can avoid developers ever having a reason to manage those, then, then that's great, right? And if it can be done dynamically from day one, then even better. Uh, long live credentials are bad. So, um, people, any Azure people in here that use, um, like service principles and PIMs and like they never rotate those things. Um, do people use access keys on AWS? Like give them to all their developers and then like they have them for like two years and nobody does anything with those. Right? Um, ideally those are all really bad patterns. Um, people shouldn't be using long live credentials for things like that. Um, so if you can use things like, um, STS, uh, and, you know, if you can use, like, platform integrated, you know, stuff, um, whether that's um, um, things like Kerberos, uh, integration with IAM, uh, anything to avoid having to have um, plain text credentials get stored anywhere. So, uh, they're on, you know, when you have developers, um, you know, handling secrets, uh, they're on their local box, right? Um, any test they run, right, depending on, um, you know, whether it's local, it gets spit out somewhere. Um, you know, each of those interfaces is somewhere where potentially those things leak out. Um, there's logs, there's deployment logs, um, so on and so forth. So the less places you can expose secrets, um, the better. I, I really can't stress that enough. Um, and these tools are really extendable, too. Uh, so I started playing around with um, just building a few extensions in Jenkins X. Um, I forked it. It's on my GitHub if anybody wants to see some of this code. But um, there's, if you basically run, like, the JX scan commands, um, you could put anything after that, right? So there's one there for running um, Hunter, a uh, tool against, like, uh, Couponer, rather. Um, but I built one for Jenkins X, and um, I'm going to open source some stuff I wrote for RBAC. Um, but there's, there's different tests you can run, right? So Jenkins X gives you things like preview environments, um, which is your whole environment spun up um, in a namespace, right, um, ready to be tested. So you can run things through, like, you know, uh, commands and comments on a pull request, right, where you can literally run different commands um, over and over against an environment. So it's nice to have as many of these utilities on speed dial as possible and also to wire those up into your pipeline as well. So um, in this example here, it was a really simple example of um, playing around with a dependency check. Uh, basically, um, what you end up doing is anything you run is um, inside of a container and then it gets deployed. Um, the way I have it set up is um, just like an ephemeral namespace that gets thrown away after the job runs. Um, but it's creating itself as a batch job um, and then it runs uh, on Kubernetes, right? So if anyone's seen jobs run, there's nothing really too, um, special about that. Uh, but nonetheless, um, it allows you to run you know, any of your security stuff um, in a containerized environment in, in seconds. And um, here's just basically um, how you add those in. Um, so it's uh, Jenkins X. I mean, you're running it locally, so um, you. Uh, I would. It would be nice if they build maybe a little bit of a better plugin interface for this at some point. But I mean, it's like early days for the tool, right? There's um, there are plugins, but not um, underneath like JX Scan. This is pretty much all that's available for now um, under Scan. But pretty much you add your command at that point, and then you can do like JX Scan, whatever tool you want to run at that point. Um, and, you know, one thing to note, uh, security management and governance, right, especially in the cloud, um, it's nice to pick up the different tools that they kind of give you to manage, um, harden things out of the gate. Uh, what you end up finding, especially in the cloud native world, is that um, sometimes there's not uh, full support, whether that's like, you know, alerting and logs or integration with some type of strong authentication. Um, so as you're picking up the new cloud native kind of hotness tools, um, you really want to do your research to make sure that um, the platforms you're using them on um, have all the things you're looking for for security, right? Um, things that you get out of the gate always are like, you know, pod security policies and some of that emission control based stuff. So there's a certain amount of stuff that you want to um, just basically opinionate out of the gate, right? What, what developers can do, um, can you run containers as root, right? Those are things you should, you know, at a higher level decide, right? And you should implement policies. So when your developers go to push containers as root and they can't do it, like, it, everybody's happy at that point, right? Because nothing went wrong. Um, and asset inventory gets incredibly hard, right? So if you look at 
Um, you know, most of the tools, they do a good job at um, cloud-based stuff, or um, there's tools to get good visibility inside of your clusters and containers. Um, where it's getting maybe a little bit better is, you know, aggregating all that stuff. So has anybody gotten on the service mesh bandwagon? Um, has anybody used Istio, like Envoy? Has anybody heard of those things? Um, so they're really nice because they allow you to inject like sidecar containers um, that sit next to your container and then you can proxy traffic so you can do things like end-to-end, um, -end, um, you know, mutual TLS. Uh, you can get all the logging uh, metrics that you want out of that. Uh, so if you're using service meshes, then you actually do get a really good extension of visibility. Um, other than that, I've found that there's definitely a lot of kind of jimmy rigging tools together at this point um, to kind of get a view. Uh, because you do want to know when people push stuff, right? That's um, new things appear. You kind of want to know about that. Um, so in conclusion there, um, don't break the feedback cycle and pile up security debt kind of on the left-hand side. Um, there's a lot of stuff we can do um, at our cluster level, um, things we can kind of uh, opinionate up front for our developers. Um, a lot of it has to do with how we lay out um, things like GitOps and how well we obey kind of some of those rules, right? Um, if we are doing the GitOps thing and then we're giving people like direct cluster access, um, we've broken a lot of the kind of advantages, right? If we're having all of our infrastructure and code in one place where it's auditable, right? Um, like I go through SOC 2 at my company every year. Is anybody use SOC 2 type 2? It's the most miserable shit in the world and they ask you dumb questions for two days. Um, but it's great because like moving to this model, it's like here you guys go. Here's literally our Git, right? If you want to know why we made a certain change to our network, it's, it's all auditable in one place. So just as a business, we found that this has even had a benefit from that perspective. Um, you want your engineers to move as fast as possible, right? Like I'm, I'm one of those security people at this point in my career. I'm like, just let everybody just write code. Business has to work, right? Um, but we want to put as much in place to make sure that they don't um, just kind of shoot themselves in the foot, right? And so again, um, how we basically lay these things out from an IAM perspective, um, network segmentation, um, hiding secrets, uh, and just enforcing good practices all around. Um, and last but not least, um, applying controls at the uh, levels they make the most sense, right? Um, there's certain things that if you try to apply it to a Docker file, it's, it's a waste of time. Um, there's a better place to do it at the container orchestration level. Um, and likewise, you know, there's certain things that um, you have to think about, you know, still at the cloud level as well. Um, because uh, if you, for example, put all of your um, container nodes or, you know, if you have multiple clusters, you put those in the same VPCs, like now they can all talk to each other, right? So. Um, you can do good stuff from a development perspective, but if your infrastructure is broken, then um, things aren't going to work well either. So that's our talk, everyone. Thank you, and uh, happy to take any questions. And we've got five minutes left for questions, and I've got a microphone if you have one. It remains silent. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Um, do you have any experiences uh, you could share with um, Helm? Because um, I'm curious, um, like to know more about. Um, not really. Uh, just to know if you had like any experiences, like things I should look at. Um, yeah. You could share. Um, so his question was about Helm and anything we could share about securing Helm. So um, I'm really looking forward to Helm three and the whole tillerless approach, right? So a lot of the security issues with Helm came from the tiller um, and just how that was kind of set up. And so um, a lot of deployment issues, right, for how people kind of um, overprivilege that tiller and then they'll leave like the, you know, the gRPC endpoints open and you can talk to that thing, right? So um, from that perspective, I've seen just like a lot of um, deployment-based issues with how people do tiller um, or, or Helm, right? Because the tiller is you know, a major component of it. But in Helm 3, there's the whole tillerless approach, right, which solves a lot of that. Um, so, you know, some of the things with, like, managing Helm service itself get better, um, but then it still gets down to, like, you know, managing your charts, right? Um, you know, because that's a place a lot of people haven't managed, like, charts, right? So they've, they've tooled around container registries and code, but they're like, oh, well, charts. Well, how do I, like, um, control access that? How do I, like, scan those things, right? How do I do all that stuff? So that's, that's the other place I see people, you know, usually when they go that model, they have to build maturity around how do they manage, like, the charts and everything like that. But um, is, that, is that a good answer? Does that answer everything you asked for? Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks. Cool. Anything else? Or um, that should be it.
Thank you, everybody, for your time. Thank you.